Republicans are tough, wholesome, and for small government is not supported by the evidence. He says that Americans have bought into these fictions because Republicans have run very successful propaganda campaigns that are echoed by right-wing media outlets and accepted as truth by more mainstream sources. The event hosted by Olson's Books in Washington, D.C. is 75 minutes. Thank you very much. So let me like to begin by um, thanking everybody for coming here tonight. Um, I'm actually at the very beginning of my book tour because the book was just released yesterday. And as a result, I'm still very enthusiastic about attending events like this and talking about <laughs> my book. Two weeks from now, I'd, I would be slightly less enthusiastic. So it's, it's a good night, and, and I am excited uh, to be here and start the discussion that I, I was hoping that the book would provoke. One of the challenges um, that I have as somebody who writes a daily column about political matters is trying to find the time to step back and grapple with some of the issues that are sort of perplexing. When you write every day, you tend to write about the things about which there's some degree of certainty. And there's always questions that perplexes you, um, that, that perplex you, that you're sometimes unable to really examine in, in a deliberative way when you're writing under the pressure of, of uh, churning out a column, in essence, every single day. And for me, writing books is an opportunity to take a step, or hopefully more, um, back and, and look at things from a, a broader perspective and, and try and grapple with some of the questions that I think um, are, are difficult to answer. And, and I've tried with each of my books, this is my third one, uh, to have the genesis of the book be some question that I think is interesting and, and important, um, but at the same time difficult to answer without thinking about uh, in a systematic and, and, and thorough way. And for me, the question that prompted the current book um, that, that we're here to, to discuss tonight is, is the following. If, if you look at polling data over the last several decades, really beginning with 1980, what you find is a pretty decisive edge that Democrats or liberals or progressives have in terms of pure policy positions. That is, if you ask the American public what their position is with regard to specific policy questions, virtually across the board, with very few exceptions, the public will side with what the Democrat or progressive or liberal position is, far more so uh, than the conservative position. Despite that fact, the conservatives, the right wing in this country, have more or less dominated our national elections over that same, say, 30-year period, over the last several decades. And understanding that discrepancy, why is it that the political faction whose views, by and large, are rejected by a majority of Americans, nonetheless has had such great success politically in terms of our national elections, was something that I've, I've been thinking about for quite some time and, and is actually not all that easy to answer. I mean, it's, it's counterintuitive, obviously. One assumes that the political faction with the views that appeal to the most uh, number of Americans would be the political faction that would at attain the most success. And, and the reverse has been true um, in our political culture. And so what I think that I found and, and what I hope that I make a good case for in this book um, is the explanation for that discrepancy. Um, and that explanation rests in the fact that our elections are not determined um, by a substantive consideration of the weightiest issues that our country faces, but instead are overwhelmed, um, swamped with all sorts of petty, personality-based, and, and kind of insipid themes um, that are outcome determinative, almost uh, universally. And I think if, if you go back from and look at elections beginning in 1980, you see the same theme that we're seeing right now as of today. I mean, if you look at the Republican brand right now, it's probably never been more sullied, more discredited um, as a result of the last eight years. And yet, the candidate who is closely tied to virtually every one of those radical and destructive policies, virtually no deviation except in very minor cases, um, is someone who in virtually every opin public opinion poll is either tied with or slightly ahead of or slightly behind um, either of the two potential Democratic nominees, notwithstanding the fact that the country overwhelmingly believes that that political party has led the country profoundly in the wrong direction, has led us into a recession, has led us into an unparalleled disaster uh, and occupation in Iraq, and across the board is deeply dissatisfied with the political party that John McCain is a part of and tied to and has supported, and yet 
uh, by all rights, he ought to be behind 15, 20, 25 points in the poll, and yet he's, he's in essence, tied. I mean, that makes no sense if you operate on the premise that our political elections are determined by the citizens re citizenry's view of, of political issues. There was a, a similar situation back in 1988 after eight years of the Reagan administration um, where contrary to the way in which Ronald Reagan has been canonized, um, the country was by and large very tired of um, and dissatisfied with Reaganomics and the Republican brand of governing. And as a result, when George Bush the first announced that he was going to run for president, he was something like 15 to 20 points behind in every public opinion poll, despite the fact that his opponent was a fairly unknown governor from Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis, and yet that George Bush, despite how tired and dissatisfied with uh, Republicans the country was, ended up winning the election by a fairly sizable majority, and that's similar to um, the path that we're on right now. And asking and understanding why that is, I think, is of the utmost importance. What happened in 1988 was that uh, Roger Ailes and Lee Atwater, who were running George Bush the first's campaign, um, understood that they were not going to win on the merits of the issues uh, because the country had soured on the Republican ideology. And so they decided very early on in their campaign documents and memoranda and insider accounts that demonstrate that this is the case, um, that the election needed to turn on a cultural, tribalistic, personality-grounded uh, framework, and that the idea was that George Bush the first would be built up as this personality icon and Michael Dukakis would be demonized. Um, and those themes that were used very successfully to do that, that Dukakis was an elitist, that he was out of touch with um, the common uh, heartland values that he waged war on and did not believe in, um, defining American uh, principles, that he was weak, that he was a loser, that he was a feat, incapable of protecting Americans from criminals, um, from foreign threats. Um, and that George Bush was this combat hero who showed that he was strong when he uh, defied Dan Rather in an interview and started using salty Texan language that was foreign to him but that he had been taught in and that had been inculcated with him, um, really turned the election around. And, and to this day, Americans know about Michael Dukakis virtually nothing about his record, but they know that he looked like a loser when he wore a helmet riding around in the tank um, and that he didn't show sufficient manly rage when asked hypothetically what he would do if his wife were were raped and, and murdered. Um, and similar instances like that about that are purely grounded in personality were things that the American public knew about Michael Dukakis and uh, recoiled from. And that is the template over and over and over and over that the right has used successfully to win elections irrespective of what the public thinks about their substantive issues. And that is exactly the template um, that they're gearing up to use today, this year. Um, it's their only chance to win. And, you know, one of the reasons why I'm excited about the book being released this week um, is because I think that the last couple of weeks have illustrated this thesis as vividly as anything I could have ever hoped for. I mean, the book examines not only these themes that the right propagates, but also the media's critical complicity with disseminating them and ensuring that our elections are decided by these themes. And if you look at the news cycles for the past several weeks, it's really extraordinary, um, the issues that have dominated our, our political discussions. Um, it began about two and a half, three weeks ago uh, when Barack Obama went uh, bowling in, in Pennsylvania and he threw gutter balls and was a horrible bowler. Um, and the media decided that this demonstrated that uh, he was someone who was out of touch with the regular folk about whom the media stars know a great deal and, and can speak for <laughs> them. And, and because there are bowling alleys all the time, of course, and, and when Barack Obama showed that he wasn't, that showed that he was some sort of exotic, bizarre, elitist, um, out of touch with American values and therefore unqualified to be president. And that theme was, was knocked off the front page and, and off the pundit uh, mind only when Obama gave his now famous or, or infamous uh, comments in, in San Francisco, which I don't know if you know this or not, that's the capital of, of elitism. Um, in America, he was in San Francisco and, and he made his comments about um, religion and, and guns and, and economic insecurity and the relationship between those, those things. And literally, it's been a, a week now where the headlines are dominated by discussions of these same 
themes. Um, we're a country that, as I indicated, is on the verge of, if not in, a severe recession, um, has fundamental problems in terms of our credibility, our resources, um, our security, our strength, our political values, across the board profound problems, and yet none of those are visible at all uh, in, in the way in which the media is covering these, these events. Instead, what's happening is um, Obama, because it's presumed that he'll be the nominee at the moment, is being attacked with these same personality themes. Senator Clinton, when she looked to be the presumptive nominee or was assumed to be the nominee um, by the pundit class and, and by the right, um, was attacked with exactly the same sorts of uh, uh, tactics. I mean, it was is her laugh indicative of some sort of soulless, you know, satanic, power-hungry, almost inhuman um, evil that, that is, is culturally bizarre? And, and there was discussion about whether she had showed inappropriate cleavage when she wore certain suits on the floor of the Senate, um, whether or not she had a 20-year plan to become president. I mean, the types of, of petty issues that a country enjoying great prosperity and stability might be able to enjoy um, wallowing in. Uh, but a country that has very real political problems would have to be insane in order to focus primarily or exclusively on these issues, and yet that is the nature of our political culture at the moment. And so, to me, the, the real uh, question, the towering question is um, not whether or not what I just described is true. I mean, you can demonstrate um, scientifically uh, with looking at media stories that it's true. You can listen to what reporters say about how they cover campaigns and the way in which their affection personally for a candidate generates positive coverage and their dislike of a candidate's personality generates negative coverage. You can look at the fact that, as I said, there's a huge discrepancy between the political views of the citizenry and the outcome of elections. To know that this dynamic is what is the predominant dynamic and how our, our political elections are decided. The question that I think is interesting and has to be answered is what, if anything, can be done to undermine that? Um, and, and that, I think, is a much more difficult question. Um, and, and ultimately, I, I, you know, the answer that I've arrived at, and, and I'm fairly convinced that, that it's a persuasive explanation, um, is that the reason that these personality-themed attacks work is because they're basically one-sided attacks. The Republican or right-wing candidate is built up into this heroic icon, um, and the Democrat or the liberal candidate is demonized um, as this sort of perverse and very weak, even gender-confused um, elitist and, and, and loser, and the, only one side is engaging that battle. And like every battle, like every debate, like every conflict, when only one side engages the battle and the other side just sort of defensively tries to ward it off but doesn't really ever engage, the side that's doing the engaging will always, always, always win. And I think that's what has been happening. And the problem is that engaging this battle is actually an easy task because the iconography that the right uses to build up their leaders is not just petty. I mean, it is incredibly petty. I mean, the idea that um, strength and moral probity and a belief in limiting federal government um, in, in some sort of way that puts them in touch with the regular folk, these are petty images. But more than pettiness is the fact that they're just completely false. Um, the leaders of the right-wing movement who parade around under, under the banner of these values actually bear no resemblance to those values in their lives. And so if they want to insinuate this framework, these metrics, um, into our political process, then I think it's important to engage those metrics, talk about those attributes, and put them under that microscope, subject them to the same standards that they themselves are advocating in order to demonstrate that they do not in any way um, exemplify those values that they claim um, to, to, to exemplify. And, and you, know, you can look at across the board what these themes are. And, and probably the most significant one is the idea that Republicans and Republican leaders are strong and courageous, um, and Democrats are weak and irresolute. Um, and what that has come to mean in, in our political culture is that the Republicans like war. They like to start wars. They like to send other people off to war. They like to continue the wars once they've begun. They think that bombing other countries is a good way to advance policy goals, that it's exhilarating, um, and that it, by cheering on war, by believing in war um, and an aggressive and belligerent foreign policy, one can demonstrate strength. That's how you show that you're strong. 
Um, by the converse is, is that also true, that, that if you oppose war or you believe that war is something that ought to be avoided except in those extremely rare circumstances where, where it cannot be, um, if you believe in alternative methods to resolving America's disputes and fulfilling its goals besides war, then that means in essence that you're weak or cowardly or, or somehow irresolute. The reality, of course, is that there's nothing strong or courageous about deciding that other people are going to be sent off to war. Um, and yet, that premise is virtually never challenged. Um, one of the, the examples that I use in the book is that George Bush the first, um, when he first ran for, uh, decided that he was going to run for president, was, was dogged by, by rumors that, that he was actually a wimp. And, and Newsweek actually published a cover when he announced that he was going to run for president that uh, announced that he had to battle the wimp factor. Even though he was a combat hero in World War II, he had trouble maintaining that, that image of strength. And in, in the first year when he was in office, um, he ordered the U.S. military, the most powerful military even then, to invade a tiny and, and, and defenseless country that could not in any way threaten us or attack us, Panama. Um, we killed several thousand Panamanian civilians. We don't count them and, and we don't know exactly how many we killed, but roughly in that area. And the very next day, the New York Times ran a front page article by R.W. Apple, the New York Times reporter, declaring that Bush had finally shed his wimp image because he fulfilled the rite of passage that all American presidents have to fulfill in order to prove that they're strong, which is a willingness, as he put it, to shed American blood, just essentially a symbolic way of demonstrating that he was a strong leader was the fact that he was willing to start war. As long as that premise remains in place and there's no discussion of the fact that there's nothing strong or courageous about sending other people off to war and that it's often infinitely stronger and more courageous to argue against war or to impede war or to stop stupid and destructive wars, um, then this theme will simply continue. It would have to because the premise is being unchallenged, and if it's unchallenged, the party that's always the most pro-war party, the hawkish, most hawkish party, will always per be perceived as the strong party, and the party that tends to oppose war, at least marginally more so, will be perceived as the weak party. The other aspect of, of the strong-weak dichotomy that I think is worth <coughs> highlighting is the fact that the greatest misconception that Democrats and progressives and liberals, especially in Washington, have had for a very long time is that the reason Republicans are perceived as strong is because they believe in this hawkish foreign policy, and that's strong. And therefore, in order for liberals to avoid appearing weak, what they need to do is to replicate that approach as much as possible, um, almost to the point where they become carbon copies of it, in order to eliminate this discussion from the political arena and then the elections can focus on what they perceive to be their strong points, whether that's economic security or social programs and the like. The reality is exactly the opposite of the advice that they've been getting and of the path that they've been taking for, for decades now. Um, Michael Dukakis, when he first ran for, for president, um, had the advice of Susan Estridge who told him um, that the most important thing that he could do was to immediately abandon the label liberal and insist that he was not a liberal at all, even though it really seemed like as governor of Massachusetts he was the standard classic liberal in every single possible way, that he had to convince the American public that liberal was not anything that he was like. Instead, he was simply a competent technocrat. Um, and since then, <coughs> Democrats and progressives have been characterized largely by the behavior where they apologize for their own belief system. They run away from the obligation to defend and advocate those beliefs, those beliefs because they believe that those beliefs are what make them appear weak. The reality is it's the running away from those beliefs, the unwillingness to take a stand for what their political values really are, the fact that they lack the courage of their convictions that is what has made them look weak in the eyes of Mer Americans for so long. And that's something that Republicans on the right have long understood. Um, there's a whole litany of, of issues where the right has taken positions that were extremely unpopular among American citizens. Um, impeachment, for example, every single poll showed that overwhelmingly Americans thought that impeachment was a bad idea. And yet Republicans pursued it unapologetically to the very end. If you look now at the Iraq war, 
Um, the Iraq War is probably the single most unpopular war in American history, if not the most unpopular war, and yet there have been virtually no defections um, in the Republican steadfast, steadfastness of supporting that war and of opposing withdrawal, even though it's politically unpopular because they embrace their position and they stick to it until the end. And that is what makes them look strong, not the specific policies. By contrast, what you have are democratic strategists telling democratic politicians that to oppose the war will make them look weak because war opposition is a sign of weakness. And therefore, they can't really follow through on what it is that they think. They can't really stand up to the president in the realm of terrorism or in the realm of war because to do so will leave them open to charges of being weak and so they constantly equivocate and they apologize for what their positions are and they take tepid stances rather than taking clear stances that are based on political principle and Americans see them equivocating and see them afraid to take their own positions and it's then that they look weak, not when they advocate their positions and political values but when they are afraid to. And so until this changes, until this dynamic changes, um, you know, George Bush stand, stood up in, in the 2004 Republican National Convention acceptance speech, by which time he was already an unpopular incumbent, by which time the Iraq War was already unpopular. And the defining line of that acceptance speech was, you may not always agree with me, but you'll always know where I stand. That was the way in which uh, George Bush tried to present an image of strength, not by taking positions that he thought that Americans liked, but by telling Americans that he would stand firm in support of his values. That is what ultimately strength is about. Not that George Bush really did that, but that he cast that perception that he was doing that, and that's something that Democrats for so long have, have failed to do. The other themes, and I'll just be much more uh, concise and, and, and describe these in summary fashion and then open it up um, to questions, um, are even easier to address. I mean, the idea that um, Republicans stand for uh, the values of mainstream Americans or traditional marriage when um, virtually the entire top level of the political leadership lives private lives that couldn't be any further removed from those traditional values that they claim to embrace. The idea that the Republican Party um, is the party of limited government and standing against government intervention and in favor of individual autonomy and and the right of regular Americans to live their lives free of government intervention when over the last eight years and during the Reagan years the government has ballooned in, its, in the scope of its power, um, in, in its spending, um, in, in the reach that it has into the lives of American citizens. Um, we are a, a country that over the last eight years has vastly expanded the national security state, the surveillance state, the power of the president to collect data about what Americans do in their private lives, to listen in on them, to read their emails, listen to their conversations without warrants of any kind, without checks. The idea that this is the party of limited government is laughable on its face, and yet that premise, too, is, is never challenged. And so the right wing's tactics um, are, are effective and they're dishonest. The dishonest part is something that ought not to be replicated, even if it's politically expedient to do. But the effective parts, um, even when they're petty and lowly and distract from what the issues of, uh, that our country needs to face um, are, is something that needs to be directly engaged. And that hasn't happened yet. And the reason it needs to be directly engaged is not because we want to take both sides and drag it down into the muck even further. It's because unless those tactics are engaged and directly addressed, they're going to continue to be effective. They're going to continue to exclude a consideration of substantive issues from our political process. And so the idea of engaging them and not allowing right-wing leaders to build themselves up as these absurd, laughable, deceitful caricatures is not about joining the right down in the mud. It's about neutralizing those tactics, rendering them impotent, so that the election and our political discourse no longer can be decided in this unilateral way down in the mud, but then we'll have to shift out because now those tactics are being neutralized into more substantive areas. And at the very least, um, to stop this deceit where right-wing leaders prance around as everything except what they really are um, while demonizing and, and destroying the character um, of any democratic or, or progressive or, or liberal candidate and ensuring um, that our elections are, are won by a political faction 
that espouses views that, that are rejected by the overwhelming preponderance of, of Americans. And that's been happening for several decades, and I think there's no greater challenge, especially now, um, than, than finding a way to, to stop that and, and to reverse it. And, and my book is an effort to ask how that can be done and, and propose some uh, potential uh, solutions. So with that, um, let me thank you again very much for, for coming tonight, and um, I'm going to be happy to take questions or, or comments. Um, yep. Um, thank you very much for the talk. And um, a couple things. Uh, Barack Obama has been the recipient lately by his Democratic uh, opponent of some personality attacks. And the way he's responded seems unique for Demo, you know, from candidates in the past, and at, at the present time, they don't seem to be sticking in the way you know they might have. Um, could you just address how he may be different in that way, and how he? And I think part of it is is that he does hone to his principles. He never gives in. So in a way, he's not yielding his identity to the attacks, which is what a lot of Democrats have done in the past. So. Uh, but if you could talk, address that in terms of how he might fare in a general election. And then the other part is um, Progressive Talk Radio has um, many of the Progressive Talk hosts have been um, not only going after the policy uh, differences that they have with uh, John McCain, but they are starting to do some of that personality. They're trying to turn the tables by doing some of that personality stuff on there. So I was wondering if you could talk about those two issues in terms of their impact. Uh, those are both, both great questions. Thank you. Um, the, with regard to the first, I mean, I've written several times about some exemplary responses that I think Obama has given to some of these attacks. One in particular really struck me, um, which was when uh, really, it, Obama had had pretty favorable media coverage um, up until the point that it seemed like he actually might win, um, and and it was really once the the prospect that he might win um, really sunk in with a lot of people. Did did this all start getting unleashed? And and one of the very first um, signs of this was the controversy over the fact that he wouldn't wear his lapel pin. Um, and, and that kind of picked up steam right around the time that his wife had said um, the, that this was the first time that she was really proud of, of the political process um, in this country. And all of these things were being sewn together to suggest that he hated America. Um, and, you know, that too is a, as standard of an attack as, as it gets ever since, um, you know, the, the whole demonization of Jimmy Carter and Michael Dukakis and his card carrying ACLU membership and, and his Pledge of Allegiance position and, and things of that nature. Um, and, Obama, what, what politicians typically do in those situations is if they're caught not wearing a lapel pin, um, you know, they'll run to put as many American flags around themselves every single time they speak as, as possible, and, and they'll be sure to sing, you know, patriotic songs every time there's a camera nearby, and what Obama did was the opposite. Um, he said, yes, I, I've refu I'm not wearing a lapel pin anymore because I think these are cheap displays of patriotism, and I think Americans know that patriotism isn't demonstrated by how many lapel pins you wear. Instead, I'm eager to have the debate over what real patriotism is, and I want to have that debate with the party that has dragged us into this destructive war and has dismantled our constitutional values um, and unraveled everything that has always made America great in terms of our political values. That was a perfect um, response because he refused to, to accept the premise that he needed to be on the defensive. And then he went on the attack offensively and said, let's talk about if patriotism is going to be the metric that they want to inject, let's talk about how that really ought to be applied. And that's exactly the type of thing um, that I'm talking about needs to be done uh, a lot more. Having said that, um, you know, I think it really remains to be seen whether or not um, the idea that you can really kind of remain above these sorts of attacks <coughs> and not engage in them um, bilaterally. Um, is something that can be sustained for a long period of time. Americans will tell you, if you ask them, that they don't want these drudge-like personality attacks playing any role in our political system. And yet, every time they do, they end up having a great inf influence on the outcome of the election. Why is that? Because these kind of attacks, even though they're petty, are really potent. I mean, they trigger important cultural and psychological and tribalistic identifying impulses. And so, once there's really a Democratic nominee, the right-wing noise machine and all of its slimy appendages and, and, and all of their media partners are really going to gear up, um, whether the nominee is Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, and it's going to be extremely ugly. 
um, because it's their only chance to win, is to be that ugly, even uglier than normal. And when there is that degree of an assault that's that coordinated, um, and the candidate who is the target of it is refusing, in essence, to return fire along the same lines, I think it remains to be seen whether or not um, even those sort of more elevated and, and, and emphatic responses um, will, be, will be sufficient. I don't see how an election can be won, no matter what people think of John McCain's economic mastery or his view on Iraq, um, if he's allowed to be depicted as this honor-bound, upstanding, post-partisan uh, man of principle. And the other candidate is, you know, a radical uh, ally of the Weather Underground who is essentially a Muslim terrorist um, and a um, black Christian radical at the same time who hates America. Um, you know, those are potent themes. And if that really is the framework that's going to take root, um, I'm not sure it's going to matter much uh, what the rest of, of the issues are. I think there's a threshold, a, a, an equalizing um, a point that has to be reached before the issues can start to matter as much as they ought to. Um, as far as, you know, what you asked about uh, progressive radio and, and other things, there are um, instances where people are talking about McCain's personal life and, and saying things like, if you want to talk about, you know, what really is, is the character of a person, you know, let's talk about the fact that when he returned from Vietnam and found his wife who was, you know, in a near fatal car accident, raising his children, and, and as a result of that accident was debilitated and, and several uh, uh, inches shorter and, and many, many pounds heavier. Um, and when he returned and saw that, he almost immediately began um, having adulterous affairs and, and finally found a woman who was much, much younger and much, much prettier and much, 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 much richer. Um, and he then dumped his wife and, and his children didn't talk to him for several years as a result. And he married that woman whose family wealth then fueled his political uh, career and kept him in the lap of luxury, this man of, of, of the regular people, um, for the last three decades, um, then I think those things ought to be discussed because if they're not, there's going to be this one-sided um, uh, framework. The problem is that there is nothing comparable to the right-wing noise machine. I mean, progressive radio is a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, and, and there's not that uh, partnership forged with the establishment press at the right wing more and more of the mainstream media's questions. It, it's getting better, um, but, it, but it's still nowhere equal. Yep. Um, I have two questions here. First of all, isn't when you said that there was a one-sided fight, and it is a one-sided fight, but it's really kind of two forces, as not only the right-wing uh, machine, but the corporate media who joins the right-wing machine, isn't it also in their economic interests through, to pursue their own media consolidation and, you know, to inflate their own salaries and money and all that to be attacking uh, the Democratic candidate, where the candidate is. And second question, the primary has produced record number of primary voters within the Democratic states. Does, will that, does that signify anything in the future as we head to the general uh, election? Right. Uh, as far as the media is concerned, there's obviously all sorts of motivations as to why the establishment press has been hostile to the Democratic candidate and, and, and far more favorable to the Republican candidate. Some of it is personality-based, um, some of it is cultural, some of it is, is this sort of peer pressure, some of it is the fact that they're dependent on power, and power has been Republican power um, for the last 15 years, and some of it is ideological interest embedded in corporate ownership. Um, regardless of what the motivations are, that's just a fact that the establishment press is that way. Um, you can sort of sit back in resignation and say, well, the cards are, are the deck is stacked against us um, because the establishment press hates us and loves them. Um, or you can say, we understand that obstacle and need to perfect and improve our strategies um, for how to get our messaging, for how to get better control of our messaging, notwithstanding those obstacles. Shaming individual reporters, shaming individual news outlets, um, having um, people who are, are Democrats and progressives who get media attention articulate these messages, raising lots of money and having smart and aggressive campaigns aimed at destroying John McCain's character if they're destroying Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's character um, in an honest but a, a, an aggressive way um, are all things that can be done to circumvent that even if they don't completely mitigate that, that disadvantage. Um, so yeah, that, that obstacle is there. But it doesn't mean that it has to be as one-sided um, as it's been. 
As far as Democratic uh, intensity, it's obviously much greater. I mean, the country hates Republicans. I mean, they just do. Um, and they hate the war, and they hate economic management, and they hate George Bush and Dick Cheney. They hate everything about the Republican Party. But you can't ask for a more discredited and toxic brand um, than the Republican Party is right now. And that's why John McCain, just like George Bush did in 2000, is running as a different kind of Republican and someone who uh, deviates from his party and pushes them away. The reality is he doesn't. And especially on the issues that have caused Americans to hate that party, um, he's one of the, the most loyal foot soldiers for it. And so, um, yes, there is that intensity, but the polls um, aren't reflecting this advantage. And I think the reason is what I uh, started off by, by discussing, which is that McCain is built into this um, sort of venerated figure, um, while Hillary, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama almost without the help of the press and the right right now, are tearing each other down and, and doing the work for, for the Republicans, and that's only going to get much, much worse. Um, yeah, in the back. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what you're talking about as far as the fact that image politics seems to be driving the debate in our country. But I think that one of the things that I'd like you to address that I haven't really heard you talk about that much yet is the fact that Although, you know, the country is furious and we're all very, very angry and everybody's, you know, we're upset with the war, we're upset with everything else, um, you know, the economy's doing terribly, that there doesn't seem to be a lot of action on the part of the public. And I see more apathy than I see um, anybody trying to drive this. I mean, the fact that, you know, Obama's bullying and his, like, most recent comments are driving what's in the media right now as opposed to the things that are going on with torture and Iraq war itself. Um, I mean, is there? Any, do you think that it's just that the media is so powerful that it, you know the normal people can't drive what's going on? Or I mean, in my eyes, it just seems that there's so much apathy right now because I don't even know what um, that that's really causing the problems rather than, and that's what's allowing image politics rather than policy to be driving what's going on in the country. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a hard question to answer, um, both in general and in this kind of a, a, a format, um, given time constraint and, and the like. Um, and, and even if you had all the time in the world, it's a hard question to answer. Um, why, why is there so much apathy when, when there ought to be virtually none? Um, I think the primary factor, to the extent that there is this pervasive apathy that you're describing, is the fact that people have given up on the idea um, that there's anything that they can do that actually matters, that the behemoth of, of the Beltway political and media establishment is so enormous. Um, and so removed from anything that they can affect um, that there's a resignation in essence. Um, and, and when Obama tried to explain his comments in, in the capital of elitism, um, that's essentially what he said, which is that what he means is that the reason why that kind of, in, that kind of um, anger makes people move into the cultural realm, away from political realm, is because they stop, stop believing um, that the political culture can never really do anything for them. Having said that, I think it's important not to overstate the, the, the extent of the apathy. Um, this gentleman was just pointing out that there's been unprecedented amount of participation in Democratic primary, enormous numbers of, of new voters. Um, for once, the youth vote is actually showing the promise that, that has been touted for it. Um, there's enormous amounts of money that are being raised from, from small donors, even in times of, of economic difficulties, where people obviously feel like it's critically important to do what they can to change the political culture. The growth of online um, activism and blogs, I think, is another indication where hundreds of thousands of people every single day in their spare time instead of you know sitting on their couch and, and watching um, crappy television are turning on their computer and, and choosing to read you know detailed discussions of bills before subcommittees and, and how to affect change in, in our political system so um, yeah there's more apathy than it ought to be um, but I think it's, it's it's diminishing as a result of this anger towards the political class yep it seems to me that the Republicans understand something that we as Democrats unfortunately do not and I'd like you to comment on it, and that is that as a species, we're not homo sapiens. All of our discussion about policy this and policy that is predicated on the concept that we're homo sapiens. We're not homo sapiens. What drives us is emotions. All of us. In all of our major meetings, that's what the Republicans work on. They work on the idea of pushing people's emotional buttons. And we as Democrats, I think, need to understand that. Right. And our, our dialogue, our framing, etc., has to be built upon that concept that we're not homo sapiens. It doesn't matter your 10 point plan on this or your 20 point plan on that. And the person that I think has gotten closest to this 
is in the in the book uh, the political brain by right, Western. Western, yeah. and Western. And I think we would all be much much better off if we you know took what he is saying to heart and 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 also recognize that this concept of homo sapiens is a recent construct and it's a fallacy. Right. I mean, you know, I think I think that's an important observation. Um, although uh, I think it it only takes you so far because. Uh, there are all sorts of ways to package uh, emotionally appealing messages. Uh, you can speak about 10-point policy plans um, and inspire all sorts of emotions. Um, if you talk about uh, the ways in which they lift people up and, and the way that in which their lives are improved and the way in which it elevates um, the national interest, you can talk about, you can trigger strong emotional responses if you engage in uh, personality um, building or personality destruction or triggering some of these themes. So I think you're absolutely right that uh, one of the things the Republicans have done far better is tap into these emotional reservoirs that, that influence even the most rational uh, among us. Um, and and um, I think there's a squeamishness on the part of Democrats and liberals over the idea that, well, dealing with emotions um, is sort of manipulative and it's much more noble and elevating. Um, to stay above the fray and, and strictly speak about matters in a, in, a, in a rational manner. You can be passionate and you can trigger emotions and still speak the truth and still talk about policy um, in, in a very insightful and, and noble way. So they're not mutually exclusive. And, and, and I think you're right, though. There, there is this sense that um, packaging political messaging in a way that's designed to trigger passion um, is, is somehow untoward. And, and I agree that that needs to be abandoned. About Dukakis. Think about if Dukakis had answered that question, how most of us in this room would hopefully would have answered that question. And how different things would have been. I mean, it was it was dishonest. The way he answered it was dishonest. Yeah, I mean I think if we look at this the campaigns you've been talking about, just since you talked about that, they were often our campaigns, the Democratic campaigns were often run by lawyers. And no reflection on you because you're a lawyer. Right. <laughs> right. Now, an we have, lawyer. We have yeah. David Axelrod, and you know, um, Bush one had Atwater, and Bush two had Karl Rove, and, and and so I think that Axelrod is from the heartland. I think that, and I think that Obama has shown that he can run a good campaign. So I, I feel more comfortable, and, and I just I don't want to get into this black and white. We're good, they're bad. I don't, and I don't think that we're going to sell that in the campaign. He has a different approach to global warming. He has a different approach to immigration. He granted immunity to torturers. He has a different approach to other issues. So, and he's good and he's bad. Well, no, but the point is, you're going to go out into middle America. That's We people on the coast have to stop thinking about why the Republicans are evil and thinking we, we need it to be guided, in my opinion, because I'm an Obama supporter, by Obama. And his he's building a broad coalition. And it's not going to be gun control, pro-choice, et cetera, et cetera. Right. It's going to be all of America. That's what he's trying to do. Right. So I just think that we need to get away from this right-wing evil stuff. Right. I don't think the issue is right-wing evil. Um, I think the issue is that if the right advances arguments about who and what they are that are false, um, that they need to be rebutted. Um, and I think that if the right advances arguments about who and what Democrats and progressives are, that those need to be rebutted as well. Um, and so, you know, I think the idea that you're describing is not a new idea in the sense that, for the most part, Democratic campaign consultants have essentially believed in exactly what you're describing, which is we need to get away from this divisive rhetoric. Um, we need to show that we're not going to be as combative and as absolute as the right wing. We need to show that we're actually much more towards the middle. And, and, and what that's done is oftentimes it's muddled things and it's made the Democrats unwilling to take on debates and, and arguments and fights that the right was actually pursuing. In an ideal world, um, you know, I think you're absolutely right that it would be really nice uh, if we just all sort of came together and even when we disagreed on political issues, we could all sit down and, and in a very civil and constructive way um, work those out. That would be the ideal thing. But wishing that that were so or saying that you're going to abide by those rules even when the other side isn't, I think is a recipe for, for defeat. And I think that's what uh, the last 30 years have demonstrated. So I just... And just remember, Obama's consistently said talked about wages and all kinds of other progressive issues. So, and, and as somebody else said, he sticks to his guns. So yeah, that was me. I said that. I mean, I, I think... <laughs> he's made a 
very clear that, that his, his point is on style. And some people have criticized him on the right. They're saying that he's trying to sound nice, but he's really a liberal. So I, I think that he is, again, if, if you don't build a coalition in the United States, you don't win elections, especially if you're a Democrat. Tell us so, right, I think the question is how, how to build the coalition. I mean, I think everyone is, is in favor of coalition building. Yeah. Telling incidents that was kind of lost in the Obama bowling week was when the Republicans pushed back on the McCain hundred years in Iraq, and and you had the usual suspects, Mark Halperin, Politico, Mike Allen, whoever. It's like, actually, you're right. You, you know, I don't know if he said this. I, you know, and they basically jumped to McCain's defense. So my question is, even if Democrats push hard on it, do you think that, given McCain's love fest with the media, that they would turn on him, or is it going to be a constant media and Republicans defending McCain from here to November? Well, you know, like I said, I think shame is a very important tool in, in the arsenal when it comes to changing media behavior. Um, because no matter how nefarious your perception of journalists might be, no matter how, um, you know, sort of you can take the, the more generous uh, view that, that basically they do what they do because they're basically kind of empty and, and easily led people who aren't very smart um, and, and who have this, you know, sort of adolescent um, mentality that guides them. Or you can go to the opposite extreme and say, no, they're, they're tools of, of their corporate masters who, um, you know, get dictates implicitly and explicitly to advance an ideology. Um, whatever it is, at the end of the day, they're still human beings who respond to all the things that normal and regular human beings do. And they don't go into work thinking about themselves as, um, you know, sort of one-sided tools who are in the tank for McCain. That's not how they think of themselves. They don't want to think of themselves that way. And so if you can marshal the forces to make them realize that that's what they're doing or to make them feel like people are thinking that about them, they will start to compensate. Not all of them, some of them to varying degrees, um, but there is a sense already um, that's out there that they know that there's this perception that um, they revere McCain, that they're uncritical when, when it comes to him. And so I think that behavior can be changed um, such, to some degree that way. I saw your blogging heads with Anna Marie Cox. And I've read her since the infamous barbecue when Holly Bailey's on the tire drinking wine or whatever. Wine. Well, yeah, right. whatever it was. I mean, I don't, she might, it seemed like she was more offended that anyone had the gall to question her her uh, integrity, and she didn't seem to think that she was in the tank. Right. I mean, just because you spend weekends at the home of the person you're covering isn't any reason to think that you would be, you know, unfavorable, uh, too favorable, um, or incapable of being objective. I mean, I don't know why anyone would would think that. Um, and that seemed to be her point. Yep. I think that what happens is the media person who likes John McCain doesn't go the step further. Yeah, that's right. He said 100 years, but he meant like in Japan or Germany, where nobody's being shot, nobody's being killed. The, qu the question that's begged, I think, is, well, we're not there yet in Iraq. How long is it going to take us to get there before the 100 years clock starts? You know, right. I, And they won't ask him that. Well, you know, because they like him. I think, well, yeah, I think one of the most telling examples has been of how the media works. Um, has been uh, when McCain was going through the Middle East with his Middle East advisor, Joe Lieberman, um, and he was, yeah, and he was, he, out of the blue, just all of a sudden, on multiple occasions in various different venues, started accusing Iran of training al-Qaeda operatives inside Iran and then sending them back into Iraq, something which um, I don't think even Bill Kristol claims is, is true, or maybe he does, but virtually nobody else. Um, and, and Joe Lieberman whispered in his ear that he didn't really mean that, and without thinking, he mindlessly repeated what Joe Lieberman had whispered in his ear and said, I didn't mean that, I meant they're training Shiite extremists. Um, and and uh, really, there were two distinct possibilities um, that ought to have been explored. Either he had no idea what he was talking about, about the most basic matters in his area of, of, of great expertise, which is, I don't know if you know this, foreign affairs and oh. national security. McCain's a, an expert in, in that. Or um, he was engaged in the kind of deceit that the Bush administration has um, perpetrated for the last eight years of linking whoever the enemy of the week is to al-Qaeda. Um, this is the country or the faction that we hate. Did you know that they're working with al-Qaeda? Um, yeah, or, well, that was ultimately what they decided that they, they wanted to go with because that was, that was the, 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 the sort of most benevolent. But um, what the media decided, and I'm not, you shouldn't 
think this because I'm saying that this is what I think they were doing. They, you should think that this is what they were doing because they said that this is what they were doing. Is They essentially decided it wasn't a story because they know that McCain really knows a lot about the Middle East, so it couldn't be that he was mistaken. Um, and they also know about him that he's a really honest guy. I mean, he's an honor-bound man of, of principle. He's a straight talker. Um, and so it couldn't be that he was deceiving. Either it must have just been a sort of bizarre um, slip of the tongue that repeated itself four times in exactly the same way in the course of a week. Um, and, and so they have this under belief about who John McCain is, about his character, um, that really precludes them from reporting on him in an adversarial way because they think that if you have something that reflects negatively on him, on his character, by definition it must be false because his character is upstanding and good. And that is, you know, the real um, uh, challenge is, is to figure out how to overcome that. Um, yeah, we'll take a couple more and then, uh, yep. You called out a couple of pretty high profile journalists on your blog mm -hmm. and uh, for, you know, lame interviews or whatever and they seem to respond very vehemently that you're full of it and they're very objective and well, do, do you think, do you think they really meant that? Were they defensive? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think journalists and, and you know, my, my perception of journalists is, is based on my observations of them and my interaction with them um, are unbelievably thin-skinned. I mean, they hate to be criticized. It really bothers them. Even, you know, there are times when I mention um, a journalist literally in passing um, because I'm, I'm quoting something that just happens to include his or her name and I'll get an email um, from them, you know, vehemently objecting to the uh, horrible personal attack that I waged on and then when I hadn't even realized that I had even mentioned them, I mean, they were literally quoted in passing. Um, and yet, you know, I have noticed um, that when journalists are, uh, are targeted for that kind of criticism, um, they do start modifying their behavior, even subconsciously. One of the things that Anna Marie Cox had said in that, that uh, blogging heads discussion that I had was out of the blue, she started in this lengthy confessional slash testimonial about how um, her writing is suffering because now whenever she goes to write something, she thinks about whether or not it's going to provoke um, liberal bloggers to gang up on her, as, as she put it, um, and that she finds herself suppressing the things that she'd want to say whenever she fears that that will happen. To me, that seemed like a really good thing. Um, she was saying it like it was some grave loss to journalism, like liberal bloggers are destroying journalism because they're making journalists think twice about whether or not what they're saying is actually true or, or persuasive. To me that seemed like a good thing. And I, so I do think um, that it is having that effect. Um, like I said, you know, some are probably impervious to it, some are too pompous to, to care, um, others are too set in their ways. Um, but for many, many journalists, the more you pound at them about these behaviors, the more they'll think twice when engaging in that behavior the next time. And I think that's one of the most effective tools. Um, yeah, in the back there. Uh, I'd just like to get your take on what seems like a virtual media blackout on the uh, torture meetings that oh, yeah. just came out recently with Cheney and Rice and all of them together and deciding well, what torture we were actually going to use. I'm just stunned that this isn't a major scandal. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, the only thing I can say about that is whenever you think that the media in this country has reached the floor and that they just can't go any lower, that that's not possible. They always find a way to go lower, usually a lot lower. Um, and this, that, I mean, it is shocking. That part, I always think that I've, I've actually steeled myself to, to this reality, and yet every time I see it, I'm, I'm amazed by it. I mean, that, what, what, what else can one say about this? I mean, it really was just revealed conclusively that the President of the United States um, and almost all of his top aides um, sat around planning down to the detail what are by all measures illegal methods of torture. I mean there's just no other way to describe it. Um, and yet it barely created, you know, a ripple. Um, I mean it just didn't. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of days ago that I, I rarely watch, you know, cable news except when I'm traveling, I'm in a hotel and kind of just subjected to it um, inadvertently. And I don't think I, you know, I flipped through all the channels continuously for a few hours on, on several occasions. I literally don't think I heard a single time um, those matters being discussed. I mean, John Yu, the memo that he uh, wrote that was recently disclosed, literally said in it, um, you know, in a footnote, um, as you know, in a recent memorandum, we concluded that the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is inapplicable to, quote, domestic military operations inside the United States. I mean, that is a declaration that the U.S. government suspended the Bill of Rights in secret 
Um, and I, I really, I read a few articles on it, on, you know, a couple AP articles on it, maybe a couple uh, short New York Times and Washington Post articles. And other than that, I mean, there was no discussion of it whatsoever. And I can guarantee you that, you know, and there'll be polls that will show this eventually, um, that probably 20 to 30 times more Americans will know about, will know that Barack Obama bowled a 38. I don't even think he bowled a 38, but that's what, the 37? Um, I'm in. I'm in the ignorant minority there. Um, but but we're going to know that that he he bowled that that score. Then we'll know that um, the president of the United States and his top aides met to choreograph um, how torture was going to be used, or that the Fourth Amendment to the uh, Constitution, the Bill of Rights, had had been suspended. I mean, those facts just to me speak for themselves. Did There's. Did the Congress uh, express outrage about that? The Democratic leadership. I mean, it's among others. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yep. Oh, yep. Even if we acknowledge that these more visceral issues like bowling scores or what people drink in bars is, is of greater interest to the press and perhaps more attractive to the public, issues do get into the news. There's, there's certain things that people talk about as issues. Um, there's one that I don't see getting very much attention at all, and I think particularly in light of this question about these recent discussions of torture that were disclosed. Um, I'm, I'm very interested to know how any of these candidates would choose a cabinet, how they would how they would seek advisors. I mean, I'd like to know who, but that's not even that important at this point. And we never hear about that. Um, I would be interested to know why you think that's the case. Is it too much political liability to bring other personalities in? Is it um, just not interesting to the press? Or? You know, I mean, it's 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 a good question. I mean, who one's cabinet members are going to be is obviously a significant uh, part of what kind of pre president a person um, will be. I don't know if it's too early, and and that, those questions don't get answered. Um, I don't know if candidates don't like to. Uh, uh, answer those questions until they know um, whether the person is interested or, or I, and I doubt very many candidates think very extensively about that. Um, I've heard a little bit about it. I think uh, some candidates have, have said uh, that they would consider putting people like, you know, Barack Obama or Richard Luger or people like that in their cabinet. Um, that usually is sort of a press parlor game that gets to the candidate and they have to comment. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how substantive that is precisely for the reasons that I just identified. I mean, I think even that gets into the sort of politics as celebrity. You know, Colin Powell um, might be the new, you know, Secretary of, of Defense, or is Condi Rice going to be uh, Vice President? That stays on the level of, of celebrity um, like chatter, and, and I don't think it goes, you know, very far. Um, yep. Um, can the Democrats or progressives overcome the situation described without a serious investment in media? Um, just one example, Politico was a relatively minor investment by Al Britton. I mean, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just seems to me that a lot of money has been raised for this campaign, but virtually nothing has been raised for alternative media. We spend a lot of money to our cable networks, but our cable providers, and we have not a single channel that we can go and get anything like Fox or we get maybe an hour, two hours a day from uh, MSNBC, and they have to balance it with the five shows for every one that Olbermann has right. so that the ratings are equal. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> right. I, I don't really see, you talk all the time about, you know, we have to deal with the media or try and convince them, but it would be so much more effective to me, look at Bye. Fox, to spend some money and have an alternative. Media. I, I agree, it's a great point. Um, and, and I think not only Fox, but, but right wing radio, um, the entire industry of right wing authors who are who are subsidized and 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 always um, have uh, the guarantee that huge numbers of their books will be purchased to inflate their sales figures to make them look like successful authors, which then results um, in them going on all, all sorts of shows. Um, so I think that there are uh, factors outside of the control um, and and culpability of progressives that are obstacles. But I think there are things that um, could be done by opponents of, of the right wing much, much better um, to mitigate these obstacles. And I think that creating alternative uh, media um, and message uh, machines are, is one of the most important. Um, clearly, blogs are an effort to fill that gap. Um, and and they've succeeded to, to some degree. It's still an incipient um, uh, medium. I mean, it's still uh, growing um, in, in all sorts of ways, um, but the imbalance is vast, um, and, and that's just a reality. But I think that... Ten, fifteen people all the time. It works, but it's nothing like having Fox, a cable channel network. I mean, it's just a much slower process. It, uh, it seems like it would take a long time to be as effective. 
Times had in the one or two uh, networks or alternative media are just following the uh, Politico model. I don't see why progressives can't raise enough money to do something like that. Well, I mean, it, it, I mean, it, I mean, it takes a fair amount of money, um, and there's not a huge number of people who have that kind of capital who are willing to invest it. Um, and and when, but but you're right. I think it's probably one of the best ways uh, to spend that sort of money. I mean, I do think that. You know, it's important to realize that um, even when liberal media or progressive media outlets exist, they're still subject to the same sort of stigmatization and and sense that these aren't really serious uh, media. I mean, there are left wing and, and liberal uh, media outlets. I mean, and there are magazines and there are talk radio stations um, and and there are blogs. Um, so th there is a, a growing. Um, Framework, a growing structure, um, but the the imbalance is is still enormous, and and there's all kinds of obstacles. If GE was interested in making money, they would replicate Oberman throughout the entire network instead of trying to keep balancing him with opposite. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's the one show that has grown, you know, amazingly, uh, and then finally they they canceled Tucker Carlson, who for five years had had no ratings at all, and there were all kinds of obvious. Possibilities that they could have used to fill that slot. You know, important um, and and rising liberal personalities. Rachel Maddow, of course, was was uh, was mentioned a lot as as a, a possibility. She would have been superb, and the whole Overman audience would have uh, been a natural um, might would have naturally migrated to her show. And what did they do? They took David Gregory uh, and created you know the four thousands you know let's talk about the election horse race show and 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 stuck it into that um, slot. So they're Clearly, if it were just, you know, I think there's a question, do we want media outlets to be driven purely by market considerations? Even if you answer that question in the affirmative, clearly that's not what's happening because there are, uh, there are huge gaps uh, that are waiting to be filled with liberal and progressive programming to take advantage of the kinds of intensity uh, levels that we've been discussing that just aren't being fulfilled, and, and one does have to ask why that is. I'm from San Francisco, and I'm glad the capital of Alito's yeah, exactly. yeah. We live in New York, and I'm glad that I was here temporarily because I had been reading your blog almost from the beginning, long before you went to Salon. Uh -huh. And I always thought, you know, it's so funny because I've always told my parents and friends that I see several progressive bloggers on the television, mm -hmm. like Keith Olbermann, and I rarely, if ever, I can't remember if you were, I think there was one time or a couple of times. Uh -huh. right? This is my question. It's very simple. How come you're not on television more often? You're, you're engaging, you're personable. I mean, I, I was just like some two-headed, scary right. thing, like because I thought right. it was a horrifying person. Right. Right. I'm on my best behavior. But I'm at the beginning of my book tour, and in two weeks I'll be like that. But um, Circle? Is this a, just I think there's I think there's numerous factors. I mean, for one thing, I've I've been writing politically only for about two years now, um, and so uh, I don't I haven't tried to and don't want to develop um, all sorts of relationships with the people about whom I'm writing, which includes uh, insider media insiders, um, and so I don't pursue that, and I actually keep a distance from that on purpose because I want to maintain my objectivity and I don't want to be uh, reluctant to criticize those who merit criticism. That's a big part of it. Um, the other thing is, you know, there are people who have a lot of discretion about who goes on television. And when it comes time to deciding who that's going to be, someone who spends a fair amount of their time singling those people out and, and, and hurling them out for, for pretty aggressive criticism um, isn't necessarily going to be on the top of that list. Um, I think there are other factors. Um, in order to go on television on those shows, you need to um, be willing and eager to express yourself with great concision to sort of um, fulfill these uh, pre-existing scripts of conventional wisdom. Um, and if you're willing to do that, it's pretty interchangeable who goes on. If, if you're writing things that don't quite fit into that, you're not going to be a natural candidate. Um, part of it is I don't actually want to go on shows uh, where I'm one of three or four or even two um, talking heads where I have 20 seconds to answer questions for about two minutes and then thank you very much and um, because I just think it's purposeless and, and a little bit degrading. Um, and, and finally I'm not in, I, mean, I spend a lot of my time in, in Brazil because my partner is, is Brazilian um, and so there are times when I do get those invitations and, and I'm not able to, to accept them um, just because of, of the logistics. Um, so all those factors combine uh, but I think there are a lot of other ways and probably a lot of other better ways um, to find a, a, a method to have your ideas heard and I prefer to be a little bit patient about it and pursue uh, those, those methods in a way that is the least compromising path. I don't want to jump on uh, MSNBC just to be on it um, and then have to sort of morph into the things that, 
you know, I, I, I think are so harmful. So it's a lot of different factors, but um, I appreciate the question. Uh, two more, and then we'll end. Yep. In, in many ways, in terms of the big picture, you're preaching to the converter. But my question is, what can rank and file people do, particularly if our punitive representatives and leadership are, frankly, networks? I mean, that's basically what you're saying. And in many respects, somewhat out of touch. What can rank and file people do to try to change some of these dynamics? Well, you know, I mean, it's interesting. I um, I was at this event this week that I mentioned today, and I'm constrained in, in what I can say about it because it was an off-the-record event, and, and um, that was a condition that I accepted. Uh, but I was able to go to this event where there were about 20 to 25 members of Congress um, and a bunch of Democratic consultant and strategist types, who some of whom you would know and dislike. And um, and and. The idea was, well, let's have a discussion about some of the tactics and themes of the book and about what bloggers are, are doing and have to offer. And this was not just, you know, the progressive caucus, the kind of people who would be con um, uh, part of the choir. Um, some of them were, you know, kind of uh, long-term moderate. Some of them were freshmen who are still a little bit teetering about what they're going to be. Some were actually blue dogs um, who um, had voted in favor of or against the House FISA bill because they wanted to vote for the, the Rockefeller-Cheney one. And they were incredibly receptive, not in the politically artificial way of pretending to be, um, but they stayed for a couple of hours. Um, I was, you know, as blunt and, and, and emphatic as I could possibly be as I am on my blog when I was talking to their to, the, to their faces about what I thought they were doing that was so counterproductive. Um, and they wanted to know uh, what blogs have to offer, how they can work better with blogs, because they're starting to realize that the path down which they've been marching behind these Beltway Democratic strategists is a path of failure. Uh, and they've become increasingly open to interacting with people outside of the Beltway, into w realizing that blogs are a great resource, because what blogs are is a mechanism for citizens to work cooperatively um, in order to make themselves heard. And so, you know, when um, just a couple of weeks ago I was writing about uh, a, the speech that the Attorney General gave, uh, where he made all sorts of false claims about 9-11, and, and I wanted Lee Hamilton, the Vice Chair of the 9-11 Commission, to go on the record to say that what the Attorney General had said about the 9-11 Commission, about the 9-11 attack was false. Um, and I called Lee Hamilton's office, and uh, he spoke, I spoke to his representative. He first he said he wouldn't comment because he didn't hear the speech. Then I said, well, I'm happy to send the speech to you. I have audio of the speech. You can listen to it. How about commenting then? He said, no, I'm not going to comment on it because I didn't hear the speech. I'm, and I said, never? And they basically said, no, he's never going to comment. And on my blog, I you know, encourage people to write emails to, um, to Congressman Hamilton, um, encouraging him in their own words and, and, and passionately but civilly to comment. And he was deluged with emails. And I know that because I was, and the, the, a lot of them were CC to me. Um, and several days later, I was contacted by his office, um, and they said he has a comment. And the comment was that what the attorney general said was something that was completely unfamiliar to him, and that helped to spawn the controversy further to the point where now um, it's an ongoing controversy. And so that kind of activism, when it is focused and, and done constructively and in a coordinated way, can make a difference. The same thing happens when that energy is directed to individual reporters who then modify their behavior. They and, and, and the p members of Congress who were there last night are very well aware of the criticism that we all collectively voice about what they're doing. And they are sensitive to it. They're concerned by it, about it. They're disturbed by it. Everything that, that you're not sure about when you're doing it in terms of if it's being heard, it is being heard um, because numbers are, are loud and effective. Um, and I think that kind of collective action um, in, a, in a slow uh, and gradual and incremental way, though a, a very real way, um, can in, a, make a difference in, and is making a difference. Um, yep, last one over there. Uh, you made, uh, I just want to get back to some of the themes in your book. Uh, you made the argument that uh, in order to neutralize these sort of petty, bad personality based attacks, um, that they need to be applied uh, equally and consistently to the right. Um, I'm wondering, is there a concern that five years down the road, ten years down the road, by taking up this venture, and an, un an unintended consequence of that might be that you create a network, uh, a coordinated network, which would then may mutate into some kind of a a monster that you might not be able to control, like like the religious right, um, something that 20 years from now is gonna is gonna make 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 this side look really really bad. Right. 
Um, I think it's a really good question, um, and, and it's a very real concern. Um, and, and I guess the way that I would address it is this. In an ideal world, um, I mean, I, if, I would love to be able to go on to the computer every day and write about purely substantive issues. I mean, I would love to be able to sit there um, and write about why the defenses that the administration has offered to their lawbreaking with regard to surveillance are completely frivolous and have people read what I'm writing and judge them on the merits or write about why telecom amnesty is, is so unjust and eviscerates the rule of law or about why our policy in Iraq has been so irrational and contradictory um, and have those debates and, and to the exclusion of all others. But that isn't the world that we live in um, and, and you can make those arguments all you want and until you address those personality concerns um, and the kind of uh, defamatory attacks and, and, and degrading drudge-like uh, themes, um, none of that is going to matter. And so, yeah, there is a risk that if you start engaging in that t those tactics, purely to neutralize them, um, that you can kind of get addicted to them if they start working and create a monster um, on, among opponents of the right that turns into sort of a replica of, of all the parts of things about the right that, that we all dislike. Um, that is a concern. Um, but I think the risk of that happening um, is vastly outweighed by what will happen if that isn't done, which is that the right will continue to win elections and will continue to be a country that lives under the rule of, of this very radical faction. Um, you know, I have concerns that uh, if Democrats take over uh, the White House this year, as I hope they do, and maintain and enlarge their control of both houses of Congress, that that kind of monopoly on political power will mean that some of the excesses that we've seen over the last eight years in Republican hands will transfer to Democratic hands. I mean, I'm concerned about that as well. Um, but to me, the risk of that happening is vastly outweighed by the risk of allowing the right wing to continue to be in political power and I'll deal with that risk is the way I think about it at least at the time if and when it happens which is then I'll start working against that as well um, and that I think is is the best answer at least that I can give to your question. Um, so I think we're going to conclude uh, the, um, the discussion and I again I really appreciate everybody coming. The questions were, were great which makes everything really um, interesting and, and, um, and provocative for me and so I'm really happy about that and, and thankful for that. I think I'm going to be doing a book signing. I don't know where um, but I, I'll be doing that somewhere right after this is done and if you want to just chat or talk or, or whatever feel free to stay around and, and we'll do that too. Thank you very much. Glenn Greenwald is a former constitutional law attorney. He's now a contributing writer at Salon. His political reporting and analysis have appeared in the New York Times. have more or less dominated our national elections over that same, say, 30-year period, over the last several decades. And understanding that discrepancy, why is it that the political faction whose views, by and large, are rejected by a majority of Americans, nonetheless has had such great success politically in terms of our national elections was something that I've, I've been thinking about for quite some time and, and is actually not all that easy to answer. I mean, it's, it's counterintuitive, obviously. One assumes that the political faction with the views that appeal to the most uh, number of Americans would be the political faction that would at attain the most success, and, and the reverse has been true um, in our political culture. And so what I think that I found and, and what I hope that I make a good case for in this book um, is the explanation for that discrepancy. Um, and that explanation rests in the fact that our elections are not determined um, by a substantive consideration of the weightiest issues that our country faces, but instead are overwhelmed, um, swamped with all sorts of petty, personality-based and, and kind of insipid themes um, that are outcome determinative almost uh, universally. And I think if, if you go back from and look at elections beginning in 1980, you see the same theme that we're seeing right now as of today. I mean, if you look at the Republican brand right now, it's probably never been more sullied, more discredited. Um, as a result of the last eight years. And yet the candidate who is closely tied to virtually every one of those radical and destructive policies, virtually no deviation except in very minor cases, um, is someone who in virtually every opin public opinion poll is either tied with or slightly ahead of or slightly behind um, either of the two potential Democratic nominees. Notwithstanding the fact 
that the country overwhelmingly believes that that political party has led the country profoundly in the wrong direction, has led us into a recession, has led us into an unparalleled disaster uh, and occupation in Iraq, and across the board is deeply dissatisfied with the political party that John McCain is a part of and tied to and has supported, and yet, uh, by all rights, he ought to be behind 15, 20, 25 points in the poll, and yet he's, he's in essence, tied. I mean, that makes no sense if you operate on the premise that our political elections are determined by the citizen's citizen review of, of political issues. There was a, a similar situation back in 1988 after late years of the Reagan administration um, where contrary to the way in which Ronald Reagan has been canonized, um, the country was by and large very tired of um, and dissatisfied with Reaganomics and the Republican brand of governing. And as a result, when George Bush the first announced that he was going to run for president, he was something like 15 to 20 points behind in every public opinion poll, despite the fact that his opponent was a fairly unknown governor from Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis, and yet that George Bush, despite how tired and dissatisfied with uh, Republicans the country was, ended up winning the election by a fairly sizable majority, and that's similar to um, the path that we're on right now. And asking and understanding why that is, I think, is of the utmost importance. What happened in 1988 was that uh, Roger Ailes and Lee Atwater, who were running George Bush the first's campaign, um, understood that they were not going to win on the merits of the issues uh, because the country had soured on the Republican ideology. And so they decided very early on in their campaign documents and memoranda and insider accounts that demonstrate that this is the case, um, that the election needed to turn on a cultural, tribalistic, personality-grounded uh, framework, and that the idea was that George Bush the first would be built up as this personality icon and Michael Dukakis would be demonized. Um, and those themes that were used very successfully to do that, that Dukakis was an elitist, that he was out of touch with um, the common uh, heartland values that he waged war on and did not believe in, um, defining American uh, principles, that he was weak, that he was a loser, that he was a feat, incapable of protecting Americans from criminals, um, from foreign threats. Um, and that George Bush was this combat hero who showed that he was strong when he uh, defied Dan Rather in an interview and started using salty Texan language that was foreign to him but that he had been taught in and that had been inculcated with him, um, really turned the election around. And, and to this day, Americans know about Michael Dukakis virtually nothing about his record, but they know that he looked like a loser when he wore a helmet riding around in the tank um, and that he didn't show sufficient manly rage when asked hypothetically what he would do if his wife were raped and, and murdered. Um, and similar instances like that about that are purely grounded in personality were things that the American public knew about Michael Dukakis and uh, recoiled from. And that is the template over and over and over and over that the right has used successfully to win elections irrespective of what the public thinks about their substantive issues. And that is exactly the template um, that they're gearing up to use today, this year. Um, it's their only chance to win. And, you know, one of the reasons why I'm excited about the book being released this week um, is because I think that the last couple of weeks have illustrated this thesis as vividly as anything I could have ever hoped for. I mean, the book examines not only these themes that the right propagates, but also the media's critical complicity with disseminating them and ensuring that our elections are decided by these themes. And if you look at the news cycles for the past several weeks, it's really extraordinary, um, the issues that have dominated our, our political discussions. Um, it began about two and a half, three weeks ago uh, when Barack Obama went uh, bowling in, in Pennsylvania, and he threw gutter balls and was a horrible bowler. Um, and the media decided that this demonstrated that uh, he was someone who was out of touch with the regular folk about whom the media stars know a great deal and, and can speak for <laughs> them. And, and because they're at bowling alleys all the time, of course, and, and when Barack Obama showed that he wasn't, that showed that he was some sort of exotic, bizarre, elitist, um, out of touch with American values and therefore unqualified to be president. And that theme was, was knocked off the front page and, and off the pundit uh, mind only when Obama gave his now 
famous or, or infamous uh, comments in, in San Francisco, which I don't know if you know this or not, that's the capital of, of elitism. Um, in America, he was in San Francisco and, and he made his comments about um, religion and, and guns and, and economic insecurity and the relationship between those, those things. And literally, it's been a, a week now where the headlines are dominated by discussions of these same themes. Um, we're a country that, as I indicated, is on the verge of, if not in, a severe recession, um, has fundamental problems in terms of our credibility, our resources, um, our security, our strength, our political values, across the board profound problems, and yet none of those are visible at all uh, in, in the way in which the media is covering these, these events. Instead, what's happening is um, Obama, because it's presumed that he'll be the nominee at the moment, is being attacked with these same personality themes. Senator Clinton, when she looked to be the presumptive nominee or was assumed to be the nominee um, by the pundit class and, and by the right, um, was attacked with exactly the same sorts of uh, uh, tactics. I mean, it was, is her laugh indicative of some sort of soulless, you know, satanic, power-hungry, almost inhuman um, evil that, that is, is culturally bizarre and, and there was discussion about whether she had showed inappropriate cleavage when she wore certain suits on the floor of the Senate, um, whether or not she had a 20-year plan to become president. I mean, the types of, of petty issues that a country enjoying great prosperity and stability might be... are tough, wholesome, and for small government is not supported by the evidence. He says that Americans have bought into these fictions because Republicans have run very successful propaganda campaigns that are echoed by right-wing media outlets and accepted as truth by more mainstream sources. The event hosted by Olson's Books in Washington, D.C. is 75 minutes. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin by um, thanking everybody for coming here tonight. Um, I'm actually at the very beginning of my book tour because the book was just released yesterday. And as a result, I'm still very enthusiastic about attending events like this and talking about <laughs> my book. Two weeks from now, I'd, I would be slightly less enthusiastic. So it's, it's a good night, and, and I am excited uh, to be here and start the discussion that I, I was hoping that the book would provoke. One of the challenges um, that I have as somebody who writes a daily column about political matters is trying to find the time to step back and grapple with some of the issues that are sort of perplexing. When you write every day, you tend to write about the things about which there's some degree of certainty. And there's always questions that perplexes you, um, that, that perplex you, that you're sometimes unable to really examine in, in a deliberative way when you're writing under the pressure of, of uh, churning out a column, in essence, every single day. And for me, writing books is an opportunity to take a step, or hopefully more, um, back and, and look at things from a, a broader perspective and, and try and grapple with some of the questions that I think um, are, are difficult to answer. And, and I've tried with each of my books, this is my third one, uh, to have the genesis of the book be some question that I think is interesting and, and important, um, but at the same time difficult to answer without thinking about uh, in a systematic and, and, and thorough way. And for me, the question that prompted the current book um, that, that we're here to, to discuss tonight is, is the following. If, if you look at polling data over the last several decades, really beginning with 1980, what you find is a pretty decisive edge that Democrats or liberals or progressives have in terms of pure policy positions. That is, if you ask the American public what their position is with regard to specific policy questions, virtually across the board, with very few exceptions, the public will side with what the Democrat or progressive or liberal position is, far more so uh, than the conservative position. Despite that fact, the conservatives, the right wing in this country, have been able to enjoy um, wallowing in. Uh, but a country that has very real political problems would have to be insane in order to focus primarily or exclusively on these issues, and yet that is the nature of our political culture at the moment. And so, to me, the, the real 
uh, question, the towering question is um, not whether or not what I just described is true. I mean, you can demonstrate um, scientifically uh, with looking at media stories that it's true. You can listen to what reporters say about how they cover campaigns and the way in which their affection personally for a candidate generates positive coverage and their dislike of a candidate's personality generates negative coverage. You can look at the fact that, as I said, there's a huge discrepancy between the political views of the citizenry and the outcome of elections. To know that this dynamic is what is the predominant dynamic and how our, our political elections are decided. The question that I think is interesting and has to be answered is what, if anything, can be done to undermine that? Um, and, and that, I think, is a much more difficult question. Um, and, and ultimately, I, I, you know, the answer that I've arrived at, and, and I'm fairly convinced that, that it's a persuasive explanation, um, is that the reason that these personality-themed attacks work is because they're basically one-sided attacks. The Republican or right-wing candidate is built up into this heroic icon, um, and the Democrat or the liberal candidate is demonized um, as this sort of perverse and very weak, even gender-confused um, elitist and, and, and loser, and the, only one side is engaging that battle. And like every battle, like every debate, like every conflict, when only one side engages the battle and the other side just sort of defensively tries to ward it off but doesn't really ever engage, the side that's doing the engaging will always, always, always win. And I think that's what has been happening. And the problem is that engaging this battle is actually an easy task because the iconography that the right uses to build up their leaders is not just petty. I mean, it is incredibly petty. I mean, the idea that um, strength and moral probity and a belief in limiting the federal government um, in, in some sort of way that puts them in touch with the regular folk, these are petty images. But more than pettiness is the fact that they're just completely false. Um, the leaders of the right-wing movement who parade around under, under the banner of these values actually bear no resemblance to those values in their lives. And so if they want to insinuate this framework, these metrics, um, 